They're like this. But they can hear you now, so. Live on Facebook. You can still talk. <laughs> nope, don't want to. Anna and I had no idea. So all this wine I've had is wasted? Possibly. If you don't have it in like certain temperature, yeah. You have to have um, like the, ask Janet. We've had wine in the, um, what is it, the kitchen for years. It's go, it goes bad. <laughs> it goes too hot. We don't know how old that wine was before we got it. But will you still drink it? I mean, we can try, but it's probably going to taste like mud water. We can Not try. Not necessarily. It depends on when you Just bought. bring all of them. <laughs> Just try them all. You guys ready? No, we're yeah. talking about wine. Where is she bringing it to? That's what I want to know. My house. Oh. We're on. Are we ready, Brandon? No, hold on. So we're going to spill red wine on your new floors. All right. Well, well, now. well they're tile, so. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. we got another great meeting planned, and this is my favorite meeting of the week. It is our broker, Pulpery. It is the El Royale of all meetings, and we are going to have a fun time. So thank you, brokers, for joining me. And before we get started on these great questions that we took off uh, from our Facebook page and from questions we got through the week, let's give it up for Shelly with Prosperity. Give us some information about the mortgage market. Hey, thanks, Chris. So today I wanted to um, share with you a story on forbearance. What the F? Um, it actually was a transaction we had. We had to help one of our agents who had the listing on the um, transaction. Their seller had a forbearance um, and they were wanting to purchase a new home. Unfortunately, they had to wait a little while before selling. It delayed their closing. But the other lender had told them that they had to wait 12 months before they could purchase again. So they were about to put them into a rental. Um, and I wanted to share the differences between forbearances. We're now starting to see our, our clients try to figure out how to get back into repayment. If you're going to do a conventional loan, a new conventional loan, there is a three pay, pay, payment pay, uh, time frame that you have to wait. So our borrower effectively has to set up the arrangement and then make three of those payments, not three all at one time, but three months, so basically 90 days. For FHA today, the guidance is 12 months, so they have to get themselves into a repayment term and then make their 12 months payment. For VA, they'll actually allow, they're a lot more lenient, they'll allow the veteran to um, go right into a new VA loan. They, they just have to provide a letter as to what caused the hardship that made them create the forbearance. So the main reason I wanted to bring this out to everybody is if you're hearing that if a borrower is in forbearance, they're unable to get new financing, that is inaccurate. The information, they can actually get financing, whether it's refinancing or to purchase. There just may be times that they have to, there might be a waiting period for them, depending upon the new financing that we would provide to them. So as always, if you have any questions at all about forbearances or interest rates or mortgage programs or whatever, please feel free to reach out to one of your prosperity lending loan officers. We're always here to help. That to you guys. Looking forward to the potpourri. Thank you, Shelly. All right. So does it before we move on, does any of the panelists have any questions for Shelly that we need to start with? You know, a little potpourri of lending. And is it potpourri or potpourri? Pot, I don't know. It's I like a potpourri. Got it. Okay. P-O-T-P-O-U-R-R-I. I just call it. Read spot. your newsletter, Shelly. Yeah, Shelly, read your newsletter. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. So 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 holding it. Back together. to you, Chris. Thank you, Shelly. Appreciate that. So um, the first question we're going to go to is uh, one that Janet brought up, and it's one that I think many people don't realize, um, and it's the MLS data checker. And so just to give everyone a, a quick idea of what I'm talking about in case you're new or you've never heard of this. So when you have a listing in the MLS, um, the system automatically sends notes and information to you when you violate the MLS rules and regs. They're little love notes, I think I would refer to them as. And so what they do is if you miss a close date and you didn't update it accurately, or if you didn't put a photo in your listing, or if you put remarks that are not allowable, such as like mature landscaping, because the word mature could mean uh, other things. And so um, Janet, you brought up a great point that you're seeing a lot of these come across. And um, if you don't correct them within how many, is it five days? Five if, days on average? If you're an experienced agent, you're thinking, oh, I, got, I have five days. Well, no, the MLS changed that. And now it's two days. And the idea is everybody has a cell phone. You don't have to wait five days till you get to the office and check your computer. So 
what I want you to know is if you have a listing, you need to check your email every single day. Because initially what will happen if there's a mistake, like you said, mature landscaping, uh, you will get an immediate notice. The most common violation is, eh, for whatever reason, it didn't close on time. And so your close date in the MLS is wrong. And if you don't change that, within two days, any of these fines, you're going to be fined automatic $250. What? Now, yeah, two days, that's all you have. Now, I can tell you how to get out of that fine. If it's the first time you've ever been fined, you can take a three-hour course, the MLS refresher course, and you don't have to pay the fine. But if you wait more than five days to contact the MLS, you're going to have to pay the fine and change it in the uh, and take the MLS refresher course. Now, if you totally ignore it, guess what? Your fine can go up to $1,000. And I am seeing agents who have been basically home since we were shut down, but they're still taking listings, but they're not checking their email because they've checked out, they're at home. And I can't tell you the number of emails coming across my desk saying so-and-so, has, is now being fined. Now, here's what happens. You get the email, the broker gets the email. So I know who's being fined, who has an error, who hasn't corrected it. But I only know the Summerlin office. I don't have access to Southwest or to a Henderson office. But your broker's getting it. And when we first opened the company, I was nice. And I would call these people and say, oh, by the way, but now it's just too many, too many fines, too many MLS data checkers. So if you have a listing, check your email every day, because not only is data checker an automatic program that kind of scans your listing, but if somebody shows up to your listing and you have wrong information in there that the computer program would know, like, for example, you say there's three bedrooms but really there's only two bedrooms and then a room with no closet or a window and just double doors opening into the living room that is not a third bedroom and anybody can report that violation for blatantly incorrect information so you never know when you're going to get notice of a fine so please be aware Anna, of that yes Anna, to your to your point um uh, linda asked the question does the fine increase after the first offense so if you don't fix the fine it will increase as the penalties happen right exactly you're exactly right linda it can go up to a thousand dollars so uh quick thing you actually did mention are we done with fines sorry well i guess for a minute go ahead what were you okay looking? so you <laughs> you said something about bedrooms um, that it's not considered a bedroom if it doesn't have a closet and a window, right? No, that's not that's, exactly how I said it. But. Okay, so okay. I want to make sure that, because that, that's kind of what I heard, so just let's clarify that for everybody for bedrooms. Um, it is well, just, it's, it needs a door and a window. That's it. It doesn't need a closet. And it's considered a bedroom. What yes. I, let, let, me, let me further clarify that. It needs a door and a window that opens. It's called ingress and egress. Clark County says you have to have both of those. Or to, so if it has a window that doesn't open, it still can't be considered a bedroom. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, yes. Yes, no, that no, makes no sense. Closet. No closet. I absolutely agree there. But ingress okay. and egress, so a window that actually opens and closes. And if it doesn't even have a door, it can't even be called a room. It's a lot. <laughs> It's a den. No, it's it's downstairs, it's a den. If it's upstairs, it's a lot. So um, let's talk about uh, a couple of other things on the data checker. So uh, Janet, you said close date. So if, if I don't update my close date, I have two days. I can't just go in and put in a new date because we haven't signed an addendum yet either. Because technically, if I, I just go in and falsify a date and I don't have an addendum and they audit my uh, file, which the board can actually audit your file for correct chain of documents for your MLS change orders and such. If I don't have that, 
um, what should I do? I mean, I mean, I have to be proactive. I know the close date's coming. And so the whole idea is that I'm going to go out and get an addendum and, and update my close date, right? You're going to have to get your sellers to sign an extension of the estimated close date. And it needs to be in your file because as Chris said, you know, the agent on the other side is mad at you and they don't think you're doing things right. They can just call the board and say, hey, I want you to audit this file. They're doing some screwy stuff and they will audit your file. And when does that paperwork need to be in the office? Within 48 hours. Immediately. So, so let's talk about data checker, right? So there's that big yellow asterisk thing that you click and we made it really big so people could see it. And so the idea is if you see in blatantly incorrect information or um, here's the one that drives me crazy. I'm just gonna leave the property in ER status even though we're under contract and all the time I'll see agents say that or they'll write it in a, a purchase agreement. That's why we have UCS and UCNS is because those are still, uh, UC under contract show is still a contingent status that you could show property with. Um, and that was the whole idea. But then you have agents say, well, no one's gonna show that. Well, all I would have to do is click data error and show that I'm in contract with you and you could be fine uh, for not you know, correctly putting the status on the property. But I hear that in the marketplace. Have you guys heard that before, people trying to do that? Oh yeah. We even have signature agents trying to do that. Don't do that. Don't be that person. I had, um, a listing, okay. I had a listing agent yesterday tell me that they would accept my buyer's offer if we would have let them leave it in, in ER status during the due diligence period. No good. Can't do it. It's in no contract. It's in contract. It's got to be changed. And, you know, a couple of times we've had it come across where they've asked for those things and you tell the agent that that's a MLS fine. They're like, oh, who cares? And it's like, I've told agents that if you're the, if you're the buyer's agent and the listing agent just won't get past it, you know, technically all I'd have to do is accept the contract and just report them. Um, but that's a mean thing to do. I don't, I don't want to say to you. <laughs> hey, Todd, saying, yes. when does that need to be changed? What's the timelines uh, for that? Uh, immediately. <laughs> According to the MLS. The uh, rules and regs for the MLS. I believe you have to change the status within 24 hours. So if you don't have the earnest deposit, because a lot of listing agents wait for the earnest deposit to come in, and it says 48 hours for EMD, but you technically have a contract that's been accepted, I see you shaking your head. So what's the answer to that? Well, our old contract did say that it was contingent upon the EMD being deposited in that, and many agents did get in the habit of waiting until EMD was deposited before they would switch the status. Uh, but the new contract does not allow for that. The new contract says that the EMD is not a, is not a, uh, so the contingency. EMD, yeah, it's not a contingency. And by the way, it's a curable problem, meaning that if it didn't get put in in two days and it got put in in three days, that's considered a curable problem and the contract could move forward because that has been cured. So you need to put the contract in ER, in UCS or UCNS uh, within 24 hours. Yeah, um, it was 24 hours in the MLS. And That's an MLS rule and reg though. Yeah, it has nothing to do with EMD anymore. So I think there is some confusion there most of the time. So let's go down that same train of, of thought for another question that we had. And the question was, um, you know, I, I listed a property. I went to a listing appointment on uh, last Friday, or let's say. Oh no, we've lost him. Let's Go ahead, say, say lost Chris. A listing agreement. And today- uh, uh, is... Start all over, Chris, we lost you. Yeah, you were. Am I still here? Well, yeah, but. You are now. So, so I took a listing last week, last Wednesday, and today is Tuesday. and because of a series of unfortunate events, my listing did not go into the MLS like it was supposed to. And so what do I do? Do I, do I just put it in, but the MLS won't let me input it at that time? Uh, what would I have to do to fix that situation? Are you, okay, so I can take this one unless people are tired of hearing my voice. Not yet, but we'll let you know if it comes up in the chat. Thanks. So, <laughs> so you can either have <clears throat> the, um, well, you can do an MLS change order. No, you can't do it coming soon. Hold on, let me talk this through in my own head. You can actually do, you can do a change order. You're right. <clears throat> you you can can, do, because if you change, 
Yeah, but if you change order the com to a coming soon, coming soon still have to be in the MLS within one business day. The on market date would change. The whole thing though is I could change my list date, right? Because it didn't go in the MLS. Your commencement date. Yeah, I could change my commencement date. Or you can get um, an exclusion, um, office exclusive listing, which would also require you to get an MLS change order, right? To change it from, because number 18 says that you can public market, which is probably marked yes. And then number 21 says that it is an office exclusive, which is probably marked no. So you have to flip those in the MLS change order form. And then you have to do an office exclusive form in addition to that to make up for those days. But that office exclusive form must be signed by the seller. Did so I pass? What I'm, hearing, what I'm hearing is that if you get in this predicament, you need to call Vondana to <coughs> get through this process. Because it's saying she, she made it a whole lot more complicated than it really is. Just a little change order would take care of it. So call let, Janet. Let's, yeah, call Janet first because it's easy to change. <laughs> Um, so, so the whole point is that I, I didn't do what I was supposed to. Number one, if you take a listing, it needs to be in the MLS within two days, two business days, right? And so I think that's what it says in the listing agreement, two business days. So if I miss that, my only option would be to do a change order to change my list date from the date that it was to a new date. So you could do that. The so you're, point, hold, just make sure you're, we're talking about commencement date, but here's the problem is your MLS rules and regs the co so Janet correct me if I'm wrong because you're on that board you're according to the clear cooperation it has to be one date from the date of commencement and yeah you could probably change that as an MLS change order but wouldn't I, I feel like there's I don't know never mind forget I, I, I said anything I feel like this is very, <laughs> very convoluted so I think the point Chris is trying to make is that if you miss your Com commence on date. That's the date that the property goes live. You'll and you don't get it in the MLS within 48 hours of that date. Not the date that you took the listing, but the date that you have commence on. That's the go live date. You'll need to do a change order on nope. that. So you're you're using go live, but okay. So your on market date is your go live date. Right. Contract actually calls it commence on date. Yeah. So it, the commencement date is the very first date that is listed on page one of the listing agreement. Right. And then you've got your go live date, which would probably be in the additional remarks, which is called the coming soon status. Don't throw in coming soon. We're not talking about coming soon. Even though you can do it, we're just talking. Don't make it complicated. We're just talking about a listing that I took that's going to go on live and I missed the date. Let's say I missed it by three weeks. Okay. okay. So what do I do? Because I can't put it in and I have a contract that technically is in violation of MLS rules and the listing agreement. So the only thing you could do is do a change order and change the date or go back and read the listing agreement and correct the date. That's, that's it. Re regardless of commencement or list date or whatever you're into, that's Thank the only thing. But to, to Brandon's point last week, you have to have the change order signed by the broker. You have to have them signed by the seller to make all, all and a change order effectively is an addendum to the listing agreement, right? You wanna change the price, you wanna change the status, all you got is a change order, not handwritten notes, not napkins, a change order. Anything else on that, commencement or otherwise? Can I, can I just use this? You know? Can I just put the email in my in my file? Would that work? The seller said it's okay. I I no. would you would always want to change order with written terms signed by the broker and then because you're augmenting an agreement. Now I always get the question: seller's on vacation, I'm on vacation, the MLS is on vacation, and I need to change this date. And I sent out a change order, but they haven't sent it back yet, and they're begging and pleading with me to get the price updated. My whole point is if it goes wrong, what proof do you have that they asked you to do it? What proof do you have that you confirmed that they did it? That, that's where the problem comes in. Without that signed change order, if you're taking a text and putting it in your file, that leaves you open to liability. So what would you say, guys? What would you say? Well, here, here's, here's the thing, though. You have to realize that this is a contract between who? The, the between broker and the seller, yep. right? And to change any contract, you need... The, the agreement of both parties. 
and an email and a text does not give the agreement of the broker. We're going to agree to it, but it's still not a signed document altering that agreement. So just follow protocol. Those forms are there for a reason. Anything else on this topic? I think we've exhausted it. Okay, perfect. Let's move on to another one. This one, this one excites me, and I can't wait to have a debate or a robust, pulpery conversation. Um, buyer writing multiple offers for one buyer, okay? Let's say for the sake of the conversation so that we have enough terms to make it fun, it's an FHA buyer that's going to occupy, of course, as a primary residence. It's a hot market because it's July, and they wanna write multiple offers at the same time. Can they do it? Yes. Maybe. So I, am, I have always been adamant that the answer is hell no. They cannot because they can only occupy one property. And so we debated this and technically, if the seller has no knowledge of the fact that they're writing multiple offers, they cannot write multiple offers because they can only occupy one. But if there's a proper disclosure done with the seller or sellers because there'd be more than one and it's signed and it's confirmed, there is a possibility to write multiple offers for one buyer. Now, let me tell you the scenario and then I wanna hear from everybody else on how this would happen. So I didn't believe that. I absolutely didn't believe it. I've been in too many classes. I've sat through too many commission hearings and I can just see that going really wrong, really fast. But come to find out within the code of ethics, there is no provision that says it can't be done as long as all parties have been disclosed. And so the question is, how do you disclose to a seller that a buyer that's only gonna be a primary occupant would actually be writing you an offer that they may cancel on immediately and accept another house. Would you as a seller feel good about that? And how would you properly disclose that to them? And so there's no document, there's no multiple seller notice, right? There's a multiple counter notice, but there's no multiple seller notice. And there's nothing in the RPA that says I'm writing multiple offers and may not care about your house later, but there is a possibility where that would happen. Now, Todd, we've had a conversation about this and you brought up some good points. If I did want to do it, how would I do it? What do you think? So I, I've, I've actually had the privilege of being taken in front of the Association uh, Professional Standards Committee for doing this exact thing. We had an agent on my team uh, who had a client moving here from California, literally had all of his stuff in a U-Haul truck, uh, drove to Las Vegas and said, okay, I'm going to buy a property. He was paying cash. And uh, so they went and looked at multiple properties and he said, I want to write properties on these three. I want to write offers on these three properties today. And whichever one gets accepted first is the one that I'm happy to move into. Uh, so what we did is we disclosed it in uh, the additional terms that the buyer is writing multiple offers on, on what's writing multiple offers on properties with the intentions of only purchasing one property. Um, and so the a, one of the agents of the property that we didn't take uh, because she never actually had her seller sign the contract uh, had the same opinion that Chris did was that you can't do that, that, that's a, that you're not representing your client at the highest level if you're disclosing that they're writing multiple offers. And uh, so we did it by putting it in the additional terms. Uh, I took it a little step further. I went to Jan Hawley at the division and said, hey, Jan, help me understand this. Uh, I feel like I have a duty to disclose that we're writing multiple offers and we did that in the contract. And uh, his reply, and I still have that, was that uh, they actually had just fined three agents in the Valley uh, for doing exactly the opposite of that. And that was mo writing multiple offers and then immediately canceling a seller who didn't know that there were multiple offer or that they were writing multiple offers. So that's how we've handled it. But honestly, Chris, you, your solution uh, in our discussion, and, and just so everybody that's watching knows, Chris and I debated this for a little while. Uh, not heated, but pretty pretty good debate, right? I mean, we're disagreeing with each other, which is always fun for he us. He got it from his desk. I left the office, so I'm just going to say that right now. <laughs> so, but your, your uh, way of doing it might even be the smarter way of doing it. And so I'm sure you'll share that. Hold on. I don't think this meeting's being recorded. Um, let me make sure. Um, so a couple of things I want to backtrack before I give you the, I, what I think is a good solution. Um, Todd's point is the whole point that you got to remember there's multiple layers to your licensure and to uh, the, the guidelines that we have to abide by. There's NRS and the division and NAC that says it's something legal, legal by uh, the law. 
And I think that Todd's whole point and what he got from Jan Hawley is that proper disclosure must happen so that you can prove that all the parties knew that this was happening. My only concern is what did the seller sign? If they didn't accept the offer, how do you confirm that they were properly disclosed in writing that they signed something saying, yes, I understand that you're writing multiple offers and you're only gonna buy one. And that's the only concern that I have in that whole situation is how do you prove that? And you also have to remember that while Jan Hawley is the division compliance officer, um, the commission made up of practitioners like us would make the ruling and fine everybody. So you gotta be careful when you get a ruling from a compliance officer that then goes in front of the commission because the commissioners can decide whatever they want and they have uh, of how they're gonna fine you. And so I always put on the brain of what did I do to protect myself in writing? I think Todd's right, disclose it in the additional terms, but you gotta get something back confirming that they acknowledge it, an email, a statement, something written um, that says, okay, I get it. Um, my thought process in that idea was, let's have a reverse multiple counter. This offer isn't binding until I finally tell you that yes, I'm going to accept this offer, that could work. Um, then you come to the code of ethics at the association. The code of ethics actually says, you must be honest in all dealings with all parties. And my only concern is in this scenario, if there's a buyer who was writing an offer on the property because they're only buying See, nobody agrees with him. We muted him. <laughs> I know where he's going with that. It, it, he's going with where if, if you had, uh, you're not disclosing to all parties that are writing an offer on the property. So you're not really treating everybody fairly because if you're in a multiple offer situation, nobody else in the, with offers have any idea. Um, I don't know if you necessarily have to disclose them because I actually think it hinders your ability to get your offer accepted anyway. Because if there's two offers and we know that you're looking at other property and put up, out other offers, we're probably gonna go with the one that's not. And that's why you see a lot of people not disclosing it, I think. But this is a real issue because we have had, uh, we had an agent transfer over from another company that was on a big team and she actually got fined big um, and ended up losing her license because she didn't pay the fine because her team leader told her it was okay. So it's not okay just to do it, I think you have to follow some serious guidelines on how to do it properly. So if you were going to get in this situation, you'd better probably be sitting down with one of us. No? Yes. Okay. You let him back in? Yes, you, I agree. He's still muted though. I was done with the topic and on to the next question. Yeah, I knew where you were going, so we covered it. So you're good, go to the next okay. question. <laughs> Unless there's other questions. I, and I'm seeing none. So, no. I'm seeing none in Facebook, and looks like um, Linda kind of came up with the same thing you did. Is is using the terminology of that's kind of in the multiple offer form, to be able to do it the other way. Did you talk about writing an offer that's only good for an hour? We did no, not. but but that would be a good thing too. So I used to write offers upon presentation. Yeah. And so at that point, you're not really putting yourself into a bind. So all the, all the commissioners that I talked to, all of the other uh, participants that I had in this debate, everyone agreed that the best thing to do is to write an offer that's subject for one hour and say, listen, you know, if you accept my offer, great. If you don't, I'm going to go on and write another offer, you know, an hour later. That means I'm no longer tied to that offer and I'm free to do whatever I need to do. And they could always come back later and say, hey, we want to accept your terms. I'm, I won't be in front of the commission. I won't be in front of the division. I won't be in front of GLDR's professional standards group. And I think that's the safest, easiest way to do it, if everyone likes that. And I had some really easy way to do it. All right, so um, forget that then. Uh, the next question I have is, uh, it was on Facebook and it says, how do I rescind a counter offer that's been sent out or how do I rescind an offer that I've sent out? Well, I think, Chris, I think on Facebook, that first question was, can I, can my seller rescind a counter offer they sent out that hasn't been returned or signed by the other side yet. And we received a new offer that the seller would like to take. And so the answer is yes, you absolutely, your seller has the absolute right to resend a counter offer uh, if they get an offer in between that uh, is one that they are more interested in. So the question is, how do you resend that? And I think the answer is always the same in real estate. And you should, you should know that you should already be saying this in your head, but the, it's in writing, right? You resend it in writing. Um, 
it, I've had this happen. Uh, what, what I've done in the past is just send an email out uh, to the listener, to the buyer's agent that says that the seller has received uh, an additional offer. We're now in a multiple offer situation and we are resending the counter offer we sent out. Please stand by for a multiple counter offer in the future. So th th that's in writing. Um, I, I unfortunately, I did it very quickly because the offer that we got was uh, was really good compared to what we were looking at, and I didn't want them to, in the hour that it would take me probably to get my seller to sign something, uh, have that other one come back. So. I understand that that could have left me open for a little bit of liability, but I did it through email and uh, the other agent was unhappy. Of course, uh, in this particular case, the other agent was on vacation over the weekend. So, so they got the counter offer on Friday, but they didn't have their sell their buyer sign it. And it was totally acceptable until they were going to do it uh, later on Monday. Cause they were going to get back into town Monday morning. And so, uh, over the weekend, it was shown again. We got another offer early Monday morning, and so that buyer's that buyer's agent's buyer uh, probably wasn't super happy with them. And and I would add to that, Todd. Yes, yeah, send it over in writing. That's probably most important. But pick up the phone and call them too. Communicate it to them so that they understand that's happened. There's nothing going to be worse than if you sent over an email, the agent didn't get it. He spent the next three hours tracking down his, his buyer to get this thing signed and get it over to you when you could have alleviated all that extra work for the guy too and, and created so you don't have this issue where this buyer all of a sudden thinks they've got the house. So communicate. Oh, I, I, should, I should have been clear on that. We sent an email, we sent a text, and we called. Like we did all three of those. So the, I, I wanted to be, uh, I mean, trust me, it was a way better offer and I wanted to make sure that we were covered on all sides and every side. So we so actually did all three of those. This also brings up the point that there is a, a clause in the contract that says time is of the essence. Yeah. And so when you represent a seller or a buyer, it's in your best interest to get that to them as quick as possible and get that signed and communicated back because another offer could always come in and, and kick your buyer out. So. I'm also going to add that you should have something in writing from the seller. Um, either send an email over to the seller, just confirming our conversation that you would like to rescind the offer from so-and-so buyer or have them send you that email so that you've got it in writing from them. Um, so that in case they do get sued for some reason, they don't try to blame that on you. And I think it brings up the delivery of notice clause and that's now in the RPA that talks about the fact that once I notify the client's representative, the agent, um, that's all I have to do. And if they hold that notice and don't share it with their client, of course, the client's going to be upset, but that's on that agent. So that's why it's important that when information transpires between the parties, it's your job as the agent to get it to your client as fast as possible because it has ramifications. And I, I absolutely agree. I mean, we've had it all the time in hot markets where I had a f financing deal and then I get a cash offer that's higher and no one's responded to my counter. So like Todd said, I call my client up and I say, listen, do you want to accept this offer? Of course, they're going to say yes. Well, send me an email or a text in writing saying that because the cash offer could back out and you'll now lose possibly this conventional buyer. So you want to make sure you're protected to V's point for that. And then you send over the notice, you could add a read receipt to prove that they opened the email if you wanted to. But the whole idea is the timeline shows, because here's what happens. I let you know I'm rescinding my offer and you immediately sign it and send it back over to me. And if I can't prove that my notice happened before you signed it and I received it again, then I'm in trouble. And I've now double sold the property possibly. And you can't do that. So I think that all of those pieces make up the proper way to rescind it. Same thing with the purchase agreement, right? So I send over an offer and now we want to go buy a different house because I want to do it the correct way. And I send a notice to you so that I'm not uh, tying you up and say, hey, I'm rescinding my offer that I sent to you dated this date, that whole scenario. Make sense? Anyone want to add anything to that? So uh, let me just say real quick, we're not responsible for when the other party signed it. We're only responsible for when we actually got it. So yep. they do, they probably, here's the real truth. They, the buyer probably, or the buyer's agent probably already has it signed and they just haven't sent it back yet. And so the signature on the paper could be prior to us sending notification, but since we've never received it back, uh, it's, it's not a contract. So we're only responsible for when we actually receive it. So yeah, an email, 
that's why we did all three was an email is the, is the best timestamp for me to show that we sent it on that time and date and, and so forth. So let's when move you, on to a, No, I have a quick thing. Um, what I was going to say with DocuSign, unfortunately, if you, so if you do a gets a copy of to the other agent on the other side, DocuSign will send it to all parties, right? In the same email, but DigiSign does not. And so anytime I've gotten a document signed, I will just do a send a copy or receives copy to the other agent. So now receipt was as soon as my client signed it. So that's wrong. DigiSign does do it. No, it doesn't because I've had it. I've been on the other side of it. You can actually, but you can put in to receive a copy. It's just another area. That's another class, but did you sign will send them out? They do, but they send, they don't send it to all the parties in the same email. DocuSign does. Well, I don't really want it in everybody in the same email because I don't want to share Correct. my contact information of my client with the other agent. So Correct. I would say DigiSign is probably a we actually have a, a pretty cool question that came in. It says, um, I'm representing my buyer. Um, they put an offer on two homes. Um, the home won't appraise. Like they know immediately that they're competing. The home won't appraise. How do you overcome that issue? Um, you know, when you're competing on an, on an offer. And I think the whole thing is, you know, running the comps, right? Um, if you put a FHA buyer in a situation where they're buying a property that won't appraise and you know it, what proof do you have that you told them that it may not appraise? Have you ran comps? Did you get them to sign anything? Did you show them the cost analysis? And what's going to happen to that buyer? They're going to pay for an inspection and an appraisal that a thousand dollars of their money that's going to go away. And now they're going to be pissed it didn't happen, right? So I think the whole thing is to protect yourself, put some things in writing so they know it. And if you're really setting your buyer up to fail, have you had a conversation with them about what could happen? And I think have you put the listing agent on notice to prove their comps? Um, I just had one last week where the listing agent, um, I said, hey, can you share with me the comps you use to value this property? And he goes, well, I don't have any. It's a sign of what's to come, right? Okay, so let's talk about this. Proper way to cancel an RPA. I, I, we're in contract. It didn't go well. Um, now we have to cancel. What do I do? Cancellation addendum. Okay, so in transaction, oh. there's a cancellation addendum. That cancels escrow and the and the contract separately, so you can okay. still cancel the agreement and dispute the earnest money, but the seller can move on. How else could I do it? Can I use an addendum? Use the form that's provided by the board. That's the that's always going to be your best recourse. Could you use an addendum? Yeah, as long as it's in writing, you can cancel agreement, but. We have we have board approved forms for a reason, and it also one of the reasons our E and O is what it is, and we keep that down is because we use the approved board forms, and so I would say always use that form. Absolutely. So earnest money is um, a separate uh, item that's in escrow. It can't be released without both parties' consent, right? So there's the difference between cancellation and risk mitigation, right? So the funny thing is that most agents forget that even when a file cancels, they still have a lot of work to do. And that's the thing that you're going to end up doing and not getting paid for, right? Because whether the buyer pays or doesn't, that's why compensation and representation are two different things. So keep in mind um, that you could end up actually working for your client for quite a bit and still not get paid, but that's the document. So you can actually separate out the earnest money, um, the reason why you're canceling, who the money's going to go to, uh, but I think the important thing is that a lot of times I've had parties wanting to cancel, uh, but earnest money go into dispute because they believe one thing or another. Yeah, and I would, I would also say to be careful with the fact that um, don't be advising your seller or your buyer to, to hold their earnest money if they're really not entitled to it. I think you run into some things too because um, the default section states that the, the seller will take that earnest money as liquidated, liquidated damages. And if you withhold that, then I think you could possibly open yourself up to a lawsuit to go after other damages. And so sometimes you, you don't want to get in the middle of that stuff. And if you're having issues or you have questions, again, get a broker involved because you don't want to get yourself out there where you're giving bad advice to that buyer or that seller and they're hanging on to that earnest money or not signing that, that release form and they end up in court and it ends up costing them a lot more money. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So Brandon, let me just say that I think as agents, too many times we get emotionally involved in the earnest money dispute and it's a business transaction guys. Don't, don't let your emotions drive you to give them information that just leaves you open for liability. So it's a buyer seller decision. Uh, yes, of course, your job is to advise on, you know, what the possibilities are, but don't let your emotions drive you to give bad advice. It's, a, it's just a business decision. I know you're mad. I, I know everyone's mad, but you got to get past that as an agent and you just have to look at the facts and make it a business decision. Now, I, I, I will say this though, and I agree with everything that was just stated, um, but, but however, expediency to the money also has a value. And I think the whole thing is that no one's excited to lose two or $3,000. And I think if I called up my buyer and said, hey, listen, I didn't cause you to lose your job. I didn't cause you to decide to get a divorce. I didn't cause you to decide you wanna buy this house anymore. Um, what would you like to do about the earnest money? And if they say, well, let's offer a settlement. I think it makes sense to at least put out an offer, but it's not my decision. It's not my money, it's their money. But I think if I was asked the question from my client, what should I do? Hey, listen, I'm just telling you that today we could offer and see if they say yes or no. And if everyone gets their money today, they're a heck of a lot happier than waiting down the road two months after we go to the uh, mediation center over at the justice department or wherever it's at now. Um, you know, that, that speed to my money has a value. And so I've seen a lot of these disputes being down to $500 that one person gets. They're like, well, oh, that's better than nothing. And they all, you're right, Todd, they always get personal. It's, it's, the, it's the principle of the thing. Worst thing a client can ever say in a transaction, it's the principle of the thing, right? Yeah. So, but Chris, I, I agree with that 100%. The difference is how you presented that as opposed to saying, don't sign the, just hold the money. You know, so yeah, try to negotiate it for them. That's great, but don't don't force people to into something that's inevitable. And a lot of, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to go to court over this or I'm going to get an attorney. Well, if you're in $2,000 of earnest money, you, you've obviously never been part of a lawsuit. If you think you're going to litigate over $2,000 because the attorney is going to make all the money and you're going to get nothing. Right. I mean, that's the whole point. hundred percent. hundred percent. The attorney gets paid and everyone gets screwed. Um, the COVID addendum. Let's talk about that because it came up in uh, how to use it. Um, Todd, you, you noticed a comment on Facebook today about uh, the addendum and the right and wrong about it. Let's talk about that. So the question on Facebook today was that uh, an agent represents the seller and the uh, buy side has come back uh, towards the end of the transaction asking for a second extension of the close of escrow. Um, and it sounded to me like the extension was only going to be one day. Um, but I, I, I could have misread that. Uh, the question though was that the buy side at this point, again, one extension into closing already. So we're, we've got to be more than 30 days into the transaction sent over as a part of the extension addendum, the COVID-19 addendum, uh, trying to protect the earnest money uh, due to COVID. Um, the lender was stating that they are understaffed and overworked due to COVID and not being in their office and being at home. And, and, and it was just full of a lot of excuses. But I thought the interesting part was that we're at the end of a transaction and the buy side's trying to now use the COVID addendum as protection against the EMD. So let me just be total disclosure. I, I've done this since COVID. I, we were at the end of a transaction. It started before COVID started. We needed an extension because my, my buyer got laid off. I sent over the COVID, the COVID addendum. The seller was fine to sign it. And so, that, so it worked well there. Um, so it can be done. But the question was, does the seller have to sign this COVID-19 addendum? The answer, the answer is no. no. And I think it comes back to the point, uh, my Kung Fu is strong, right? And so the, the idea is how smart are you about the, the ways that the document works and how it works in the transaction. That's why you would want to get a broker involved because we've all been through different sets of reality. Now, there's a clause in the addendum that's, it's not force manure, it's force majeure, right? And the idea is that a, uh, an act of God could happen in the course of this transaction. And many states have that clause in their RPA, states that FEMA is quite prevalent in, right? If you have a tornado, 
or a wildfire or you have a flood and it's common, you need those clauses so that it helps you dissolve a contract when there's no way that we can close because my buyer lost their job or something happened. In Nevada, we don't have force majeure clauses in our contract. And so that COVID addendum created that, that aspect where I could use it to cancel for any act of God or an unforeseen circumstance such as a pandemic that caused my client to lose their job uh, at the hotel that they worked at. And so the funny thing is that it's supposed to be used in the beginning because we all know that we're in a pandemic and now we're seeing people that didn't use it. Um, and does it have to be used? No. I mean, if everyone's good to go and they have jobs and they're obviously using Shelly who doesn't have the issues that lender had um, and you could move forward to the transaction, you don't need it. But if you were to interject it at the end of the deal because you know you're gonna have a problem and they are understanding of the issue, makes sense. V, you brought up a point a couple of weeks ago that we were in a class and we were told basically that there's not a judge in town that's going to harass a buyer in court that lost their job or got extremely sick. So even if I did go to court, what are the odds of me winning the case? Talk about that for a minute. Slim to none. Slim to none. You have a whole minute, Bonnie. <laughs> I was gonna say, don't use it all at once. <laughs> He's saving it. Well, I mean, it doesn't, there's nothing more to add. The, I, listen, I mean, look at the, right now, all the judges are gonna look at the circumstance. They're gonna sit here and, and look at the, the what, what actually happened with this buyer. They're gonna say, they lost their job. How do you expect them to close? Like you're being a little ridiculous, right? And so the chance, I always recommend, and this is what, we had an issue um, a couple of months ago, Todd, with one of, one of the, an agent in, in one of the offices, and it was trying to resolve the earnest money dispute. We represented the seller. They had absolutely no interest in giving back the earnest deposit. And I, I sat them down or you know, went on email and said, well, you have a few options here. You can you know, go this route and, and settle with them to some degree or draw the dice and see maybe you'll get the money in court. But the chances of the judge actually saying yay, slim to none. But but I, I, I kind of question that a little because they're not gonna they're not asking the buyer to buy the house. They're just saying that you've put me out and the, the liquidated damage of you not being able to close on the contract is the earnest money. I get and it. So I, I agree that the seller should probably be entitled to it at times, but there's also some things are out of people's control and this pandemic is big to a point where sometimes you just gotta do the right thing. I, no, I, I agree too. So like we said, we represented the seller, the buyer was willing to give half the, half the uh, earnest deposit. And so, you know, that's what we ended up settling on. And then, and, and here's the other thing, at some point you as a, as the agent, once that file's canceled, you got to stop me, uh, mediating this issue for the clients. It's between the buyer and seller. If you've made an attempt and they can't seem to figure it out, let's be done, right? I mean, call a broker, really call a broker. You can't continue to go and engage down this path and mediate it for them. There's mediators that are out there that this is what they do. Let them handle it. So Vonda, I think in the example you used, that's actually when the seller decided they would willing to take half because he realized that we as a brokerage and or as the agent wasn't going to continue to mediate this. We weren't going to take the other side to small claims court. We right. weren't going to do any of that for him that he had to do that on his own. Yep. And then he kind of thought, well, maybe, maybe I should just look at taking half. I think it's also important to understand that the RPA says that if, uh, the, the, as Brandon pointed out, that's liquid damages and, and that's the, that's the limit. It says that's the most the seller could go after the buyer for. And so total legal recourse. For, say again, Sole legal recourse. Yes. Total legal recourse. Those are the actual full, full, full. S-O-L-E, soul. So, okay. <laughs> Here's my point, whatever, however it's written, full, sole, total, everything, whatever, whatever legality that attorney put in the contract. Here's my point. If you don't give the money back and the buyer and or the seller is due the money back, you've now opened yourself up to litigation. You, you have a protection. If you're the one holding up the earnest money, you have a protection that if you give up the earnest money, you can no longer be sued for any more money. But if you don't give up the earnest money, you now left yourself wide open for a much larger case that's going to entail attorney's fees. And I don't think anybody wants Nobody to wins. 
Just the attorneys. Uh, just the attorneys want that money. So there's a, there's a protection there that doesn't look like it's a protection, but there, it really is because it stops the, the amount of liability right there. I think the whole point uh, is that it's the buyer and seller's money and we're just to facilitate information and take direction from them for their decision. And sometimes when no party can agree and they can't mediate because they won't show up or the whole thing, sometimes they need a cooling off period. And I, I've had two years, I've had short sales with earnest money and escrow for two years where they had to cool off, decide that life was gonna be okay and then they settle it, but that was their decision had nothing to do with me. And I think that's the whole point. We got two last points and then we're gonna wrap this up. So um, the, the, the one next was, you know, we had an agent who listed a, a beautiful home over in the uh, Northwest and super excited, was getting her home marketed, took great photos, got them on the MLS. And then come to find out her home was showing up on another agent's website um, that she didn't know about when she went to check on it on another page. And so that agent was marketing that home. Uh, they had it out there in the marketplace, but it came from an IDX feed. So let's talk about that. You know, people don't understand uh, the broker data co-op feature and how we can all share each other's listings in an IDX and the rules and parameters around it. Brandon, you've done a huge amount of research around that. Share with us a little bit of info on it. So yeah, syndication has always been a, intriguing to me as a broker because you, you've got a couple ways that data can go out. One is what's called syndication. That's what we send out to Zillow and truly and realtor.com. We just syndicate to a website. Then there's what's called IDX, which is the, the internet data exchange. And it's agreement amongst brokers to be able to share each other's listings. And by us agreeing to people can share ours, it allows us to share theirs on our website as well, which basically gives us the entire MLS on our websites, which allows us to compete with the Zillows and the realtor.coms and stuff like that, because we have the most, the most accurate data because it comes straight from the MLS. But um, if, if it is syndicated or it is through IDX, they do have to have the IDX logo on it. And somewhere in there, it does have to give credit to that listing agent. If it doesn't, then that can be reported to the, come to me, basically. We would go to the MLS and they would look to make sure that they're following the rules for the syndication. Um, similar to what we just had through um, uh, the coming soon listings on Redfin and some of these other um, uh, virtual office websites, they weren't following the rules, so they got that data pulled. Um, so if you think something's not right, bring it to us, we'll look at it and we'll, we'll bring it to them. But in reality, if we don't allow ours to go on their sites, we can't put theirs on ours. And Janet, you brought up a couple uh, meetings ago talking about the board and its involvement that you know, that they have to give credit uh, back to that listing agent, you know, courtesy of, and just like on your mailers and things like that, when you use a listing or stats or comps or things, but um, the whole point is that the board is actually auditing those and they go after those people, correct? That is correct. We have a very active, um, God, I forget what it's called now, the uh, compliance section of oh, committee yeah. that works in conjunction with the MLS board and they audit those things. They're also doing some fabulous work and checking on stuff that I'm not quite at liberty to talk about yet, but by mm, I'm thinking September, uh, you may be surprised at some of the changes that are coming down the pike. Awesome. Uh, I'm also on, they have a, a PAG for the MLS on Trestle, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think the MLS is going to start moving towards that, which will give the broker some more control on the, the amount of data or what data is sent and, and to where. So we should get a little bit more control on that kind of stuff. But um, the idea behind this is you shouldn't really freak out. It, it is still, I believe, a good thing to be able to share data with other brokers. It allows us to generate more leads and more business on our websites as well. So this uh, agent's point was if the property links back to a site, and that's what it was, it was a link from a site that gave complete credit to the listing agent that they promoted on their page, that was the issue that they had. That's not okay. So you so, cannot take a link, let's say through our, our Simplest or a Boomtown site, you cannot link to another agent's listing on your website and make it appear as it's yours. 
because it's without not. Um, Nor can you share it on Facebook or Insta or whatever without right. permission from the listing agent. If they go to if they go to that website and it's there, that's fine. But if they're drive, going there specifically for that property because of link, that's that's wrong. And I and I know this clear back when you were able to post live links on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of agents would do is just take the links from their websites to put that on there. And there was violations all over that. So you have to be careful about sharing the data off of your website because all that internet data exchange does is a lot gives you permission to share our listings on your website, not anywhere else. Good point. Bonnie, did you have something else with that? No. Oh, great. Okay. Well, <laughs> last slide. Brandon, awesome. Brandon nailed it. Take my advertising class. I talk about all of this. <laughs> Shameless pun. Um, so uh, the other question we had is we've got so many of these that we talked about today from um, our uh, signature Facebook page. And it's been a great resource for agents to provide information, to get feedback. But we wanted to have a little bit of a conversation on best practices for the Facebook page and also give a little bit of caution because we do see a lot of agents go on and answer broker questions. And sometimes the answer needs a little bit of crafting so that we don't get into some trouble. So wanted to talk about that, get some input from the brokers that are here. Um, you know, I know, I, I know I've seen many times where they're like, I have a broker question, but they don't tag any of us and I don't actually see it uh, immediately. What should they do? Uh, this is um, good because we've talked about this a little bit. Call and each of us separately. Yeah, okay. I don't. <laughs> and, but I did bring this, I brought this up to the associate council this morning and they came up, they had some really good ideas that I'll run through, through you guys to go. But I think there's some, some ways that we can change uh, the way you communicate with the brokers to make that easier for you guys and to eliminate the extra work that's being done because I get it. Sometimes you, you have an answer to, or a question and you want an answer. And so you call me and I didn't answer right away. So then you call Chris but you left me a message and then Chris didn't answer. So you leave him a message and then you call Todd and then you finally get a hold of Vonnet or Janet and then you're on the phone with them and then all of a sudden I'm calling back and then you're sending me a text message. I'm on the other line with Janet. And then after you've got the answer, then Chris calls you back and then you go through the whole scenario with him and it just, can you see how the time just kind of gets wasted there? And so it's very important that you give the opportunity for a broker to get back to you. I, I love that we have the full range of brokers here. But uh, the other thing is when you get an answer, don't go and try to get a different answer. <laughs> and I think I think the, the point is that I love the page where I know if I needed any service provider, immediately I put it on there and V gives me three people, but um, everyone is putting out the people that they have. Um, I love sharing uh, helpful tips, you know, things like that, that, that go on between the agents and things that you've seen and done and heard. and. I think that you know sharing the story is important too that that happens and getting some some feedback and information but be careful what you answer if you don't have a complete understanding of the process or of the rules and regs i mean we go to a lot of classes we spend a lot of time i've had a lot of pain and anguish in my life uh through realtor things that i've done uh to to assemble what we have and so be careful you know what you point out or say um and you know the whole thing is um google uh, I'm not kidding you when I say that Google has been a great resource for me as a broker. Sometimes the question is that simple. And, you know, what does this mean? I can't, I, I've been on a, a call and I, I'm not as smart as I make myself sound where you've said, what does this mean? And I threw it into Google and it popped up what it means. And you're like, oh, wow, Chris knows a lot. Sure, Google. Um, but I think the whole point is that you have a robust group of brokers that have a lot of background knowledge and we're all here to help you. Now, please understand, Friday at 5.30 was not the time to call me on your catastrophe that could have been fixed Thursday. And so being proactive is the most important skill a realtor has. And I think that sometimes I notice that it was your last thought of the day. And so you decided to call me, which I'm happy to help or any of the brokers are happy to help, but be as proactive as you can and we won't be um, as unexcited at some points. Yeah, um, anyone just, want to add anything to that? I would just say one other thing that it might feel like an emergency, but it probably isn't. And so just give that broker a little bit of time to get back to you so we can get it solved. So, and I just want to throw out, I swear to you, I really think, and I'm not being sarcastic or mean, but I'm being serious. I think Vonina has her phone surgically attached to her hand because she always, she's responding like in five seconds. But 
I don't walk around with my phone in my hand. I'm just not one of those people. So if I'm doing laundry or I'm at the grocery store and you post on Facebook, I'm probably not going to see it right away. But if you text a broker, I will hear my phone go ding and then I'll respond. We had a situation this weekend where an agent very sweet, sweet agent, being very conscious and careful about our time posted on Facebook. Uh, could a broker please give me a call? It'll only take about five minutes. I didn't see it and evidently ignored it anybody else. Well, then about 15, 20 minutes later, I hear a ding and I opened it and it was a text to me saying, could you please call me? I'm sorry to bother you on Sunday. I swear it's less than five minutes. So a lot of times when you post on Facebook, unless you're Vandana who has her phone surgically attached to her hand, you're not getting an immediate response. And that's, that's kind of why this came up is the thing is, is we're accessible. And so feel free to reach out to us in, in the Facebook group. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and so don't get frustrated if you post for a broker on Facebook and, and we don't see it. Um, Sometimes those things get buried pretty quickly. There's a lot of stuff that gets on the page. Um, feel free to text us or call us. I think that's going to be your better avenue to get quick service. Then your questions by pigeon. Um, all right, guys. Well, Wait, I do uh, want to add something really quickly. Um, if you're one of those agents that likes to answer questions, but you're like, so this is what I would do, but I'm not 100% sure, do me a favor. Don't type it. Don't even, don't even start down that rabbit hole because – they're thinking that that's what the answer is and you've answered their question, but it's not. So if you're unsure in any way and you think that a broker should answer that question, let the broker answer that question. We'd rather we give the information if you're unsure than you half, I, I, I don't want to say it, but you know what I mean, um, half ass it. So just, yeah. <laughs> I did that anyway. Sorry. But the, the other thing is if you see something on there that you think warrants a, a broker's response, feel free to tag us in that or text us because uh, I've had agents actually reach out to me and say, hey, there's something on there you need to look at. And so then I'll jump on there and then I'll look at it. Um, Shelly saw one the other day that an agent was looking for broker support and she sent it to our group chat here. And, and then that, that agent was already being taken care of by Janet. So, but then we knew, so it was all good. So Linda just put on, can you make sure and put the answer on Facebook when you respond? Maybe. And I'm going to say maybe because there are some responses that are books and novels and they go into depth and the whole thing. So I think that yes, when they're easy, but sometimes it it's easier by phone than it is in writing. Um, but I think we could, what we would do is we would take that scenario, just like the multiple offer one, we'd bring it here to the pulpery so that we can then uh, expand on all of the different options to make it work for everybody. Or a broker insight. Or, yeah. Exactly, broker insight. a broker insight. So, um, hey, the time is up. We, we've spent an hour on our pulpery of topics and I think it was a lot of fun for me. I know it was because I cut out there for a minute, um, but I really appreciate uh, all of you and all of your knowledge and what you do for the agents every day. And we appreciate you guys tuning in and, and taking part. I'm looking forward to our next meeting and with that, Make it a great week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.